I've shared this before, but when I was ordained, and ordination is uh, when a bunch of pastors get together to examine somebody who thinks that they uh, are called to the ministry to see if they believe that this person's call is valid, uh, they will ask you a bunch of questions to evaluate you and to check you out. And one of the questions at my ordination was really a good one. It was, Bruce, do you feel you have a pastor's heart? Hmm, good question. Because this guy understood, as I have come to understand over the years, that being a pastor is about more than um, getting your master's degree or going through school or being able to talk good or even knowing stuff about the Bible. Being a good pastor is learning how to love the sheep that God has given to you, learning how to weep with those who weep and rejoice with those who rejoice. It's really a lot like, um, well, parenting, isn't it? That you can be a biological parent and still not have a parent's heart. You can be a person who has a teaching degree, but if you don't have a teacher's heart, you're not going to be a very good teacher. You could be in the medical profession and have the, the right degrees, but if you don't have the heart of compassion that has to go with that, you're not going to be very good at your job. Now, just for the record, uh, my answer to the question was honest. I just said, I hope so. And I hope of the years that you have seen, I hope, that I do believe I have a pastor's heart. And I ache with you when you're hurt, and I rejoice with you when things go well. Why this is important to us is because Paul is going to reveal his heart to us today. He's going to show us what it means to have a godly heart, a pastor's heart. But even more importantly than that, he's going to reveal to us the heart of Jesus, the heart that, that I think God wants us to have. And so listen up as we go into this because we're going to learn some things about what it means to have a godly heart. He starts off by telling us something weird. He said, if you're going to have a godly heart, you need to be prepared for heartache. Listen to this starting with verse 11. You have made me act like a fool boasting like this. You ought to be writing commendations for me. For I'm not at all inferior to these super apostles, even though I'm nothing at all. When I was with you, I certainly gave you proof that I am an apostle. For I patiently did many signs and wonders and miracles among you. The only thing I failed to do, which I do in other churches, was to become a financial burden to you. See, sarcasm is biblical. Please forgive me for this wrong. Now, the problem here is that Paul, Paul spent a year and a half in Corinth, and, and he, he sacrificed to do this. He didn't get paid while he was there. He made tents, and he sold them. He relied on donations from other churches. And so Paul sacrificed to be there. He helped this church form. He, he helped these people come into a relationship with God. He instructed them. He discipled them. And Paul says, when I heard that you turned against me, it broke my heart. He said, you, you should be writing commendations about me. You should be rallying to my defense. You should be there for me, but instead you've broken my heart. Now, many of you have been in that situation, haven't you? You've been in a position where you have sacrificed for somebody. You've been there for them. You've been their um, confidant, or maybe you have dared to share your heart with them, and then one day they turn on you. They share your secrets, or they, they betray you, or they just say, I hate you, and, and, and you're broken. Sometimes you have a, a child that may be You've sacrificed, well, if you're a parent, you've sacrificed for them. You, you've given up sleep. You've put off buying things that you would like to have. You've put off doing some of the things that you'd like to do because you want to provide for your child. And then one day they come home and they say, I don't care about you. I don't want you anymore. I'm walking away. I hate you. And it breaks your heart. You may have been a, a, a person who's worked very hard in a particular business. Let's say you've been there for 30 years and you have worked really, really hard. You've been faithful. You have um, worked overtime. You've sought to do a good job. You've always supported your boss. 
And then one day, because you're older and because you're making more money than a lot of the people, they come in and they say, I'm sorry, we have to downsize. And you think you should be appreciating me. You should be supporting me. You should be there. That's the way Paul feels here. And that's the way all of us feel when we feel that the people that we've sacrificed for have turned on us. This is difficult because what we learn here is that if you're going to love somebody, if you're going to care about somebody, if you're going to get deeply involved with somebody, you are going to risk being hurt. That's what happens. You can't hurt deeply unless you have loved deeply. And so the two go together, kind of like a balance, that, that if you love greatly, you're risking great hurt. And some of you have been in that situation. Now, what Paul says here is that they should have known better. He says, look, I, I've, I've done all these miracles in front of you. I patiently did many signs and wonders and miracles among you. Now, what he's trying to say is that, and, and we need to understand the biblical mindset, back in Bible days, back in the Old Testament, back in the New Testament days, the miracles were primarily signs that authenticated the teaching of the person who did the sign, okay? So someone like Elijah comes on the scene and he talks about God and he prophesies of God. Paul comes on the scene. He says he's a spokesman for God. The disciples go out and they say, we're speaking for God. People say, how do we know it's true? And so they do miracles. And people go, well, wow, they've, apparently they're backing up what they're saying. So that was primarily the response responsibility of the miracles. They were to authenticate the authority of the speaker. Now, it's a little different today because the Bible has been given to us and we don't need to authenticate other speakers. In fact, Jesus warned us. He said, beware of counterfeit miracles, that there are people who can do miracles but are doing them for the wrong reasons. They're doing them to uh, lead us astray or it's about them or it's Satan working through them. But understand, miracles still happen. It's just for different reasons today, and I don't understand those reasons. I don't know why God will miraculously will heal one person and not heal another person. But we need to be very careful when we talk about miracles. Number one, we use that word really flippantly today. A miracle is, an, is something that happens that is beyond nature. It is something that science cannot explain. For example, somebody is, doesn't have an arm, and a miracle happens and their arm grows. That's a miracle. Somebody is a quadriplegic, and one day somebody prays for them and they get out of their chair and they walk. That's a miracle. Nobody can explain it. We don't understand it. What happens in our society is we talk about uh, all kinds of things being miracles. Oh, man, the, you know, Keurig, what a miracle that is, that you can just get that one perfect cup of coffee. That's not a miracle. It's not a miracle. It's good, but it's not a miracle, okay? Um, we, we say a sunset. Oh, it's just a, a, a miraculous sunset. Mm, it was a beautiful sunset. It was a sunset that showed us the magnificent artistry of our creator, but it wasn't a miracle because it was something that took place naturally. And one of the things we say, oh, you know, the miracle of birth. It's not a miracle. It's the way God set it up. It's, it's the, the normal process of developing human beings, birth. So birth is amazing. Birth is humbling. Birth is an uh, awe-inspiring experience. It is not a miracle, okay? So we have this sense that, okay, miracles, should, miracles are happening all the time. You just have to open up your eyes. Miracles aren't happening all the time because if they were happening all the time, they wouldn't be miracles, okay? You get that? So there were miracles happening. There are miracles that happen today. But in Paul's case, he was saying, look, you should understand. You know me. You've seen me. You heard me teach. You saw the way that I lived among you. You saw the signs that I gave you. How could you turn on me? 
So the message here is that we need to be careful. If we're going to have a godly heart, we're going to risk being hurt. But second, if we're going to have a godly heart, we need to learn how to love. Listen to Paul's words in 14 through 18. Now I'm coming to you for the third time, third visit that he was going to make, and I will not be a burden to you. I don't want what you have. I want you. After all, children don't provide for their parents. Now remember, Paul thinks of himself as the parent of this church in Corinth, okay? So parents provide for their children. I will gladly spend myself and all I have for you, even though it seems that the more I love you, the less you love me. I'm willing to keep sacrificing for you because I consider myself to be your parent. Some of you admit I was not a burden to you, but others still think I was sneaky and took advantage of you by trickery. But how? Did any of the men I sent you take advantage of you? When I urged Titus to visit you and sent our other brother with him, did Titus take advantage of you? No, for we have the same spirit and walk in each other's steps doing things the same way. Now the charge that was being brought against uh, uh, Paul was that he was somehow exploiting the church. He's really in this for the money. He's in it for the uh, fame that he's going to get. He's in it to add to his resume, whatever the, the charge was. And Paul says, that's not true. I am not interested in what I can get from you. I'm interested in you. See, he reminds us that the true godly heart is one that doesn't see people in terms of what they can do for us. They see people in terms of their needs and their personalities and who they are. And we don't look at people in terms of, of their social standing or their history, their background. We don't look at them in terms of their, their gender. We don't look at them in, in any of those ways. That, that, it's irrelevant. What we see is a person who is loved by God. And so we love that person too. That's what we should be doing. But that's hard, isn't it? That's not our default position. Let's just be honest and say that, that when we relate to other people, we tend to look at them in terms of what they can do for us. Have you ever said to yourself, I don't know why I should waste my time on that person? Hmm. Why? I don't want to waste my time because there's nothing in it for me. What's in it for me to get involved with that person? Why should I even bother with that person? Because they're not all that important. That's not a godly heart. A godly heart doesn't look at those things, isn't concerned about that stuff. In verse 19, Paul writes, Perhaps you think we're saying these things just to defend ourselves. No, we tell you this as Christ's servants and with God as our witness. Everything we do, dear friends, is to strengthen you. Wow, there's a godly heart. Not looking at what I can get, not looking for what this is going to do for me, but looking at, at how can I help you grow? How can I help you develop? How can I help you hopefully even grow to the point where you can, you can pass me in spiritual growth? Here's some questions that maybe we should ask ourselves. Um, are we speaking, acting, and desiring to truly help and strengthen others by our words and actions? Or are we hoping to win? Are we hoping by getting involved with another person, we can prove to them that we're right, they're wrong? Nah, 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 nah. You know, sometimes we do that. I mean, let's be honest, sometimes we do that. Second, are we trying to gain an advantage? Are we engaging in a power move? Do we say, if, if I get involved with this person, this is going to help me in my future. This is going to help me move up the ladder of success. If I get involved with them, oh boy, this could be really good for me. Mm. Do we hope to gain something from the relationship? Are we looking to exploit this relationship? You know, one of the worst things that we do as Christians sometimes Somebody comes into our church and we say, you know, we really need to get that person into our church because, you know, they'll give a lot of money. Oh, God, forgive us if we take that approach. That is exploiting another person. It is totally irrelevant to what we're supposed to be doing. But sometimes we relate to people on that basis. Do we desire to prove that we are spiritually greater than them? Are we, are we arrogant? 
Is this about saying, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be nice to them because I'm a godly person and I'm going to prove it to them? See, all that stuff is wrong. If we have a truly godly heart, we see past what that person can do for us or the cost that it's going to be for us. We relate to them purely and simply because they are loved by God. So, we need to learn how to love. The third thing he tells us is that we need to, if we're going to have a godly heart, desire the growth of other people. Listen to what he says in verses 20 and 21. For I'm afraid that when I come, I won't like what I find. And you're not going to like my response. I'm afraid that I will find quarreling, jealousy, anger, selfishness, slander, gossip, arrogance, and disorderly behavior. Now, the reason he was afraid he was going to find that is because that's what was going on in the church. Yes, I'm afraid that when I come again, God will humble me in your presence, and I will be grieved because many of you have not given up your old sins. You've not repented of your impurity, sexual immorality, and eagerness for lustful pleasure. Hmm. Now, what, what Paul is saying is, I, I want you people to understand what being part of the gospel is, what being part of Jesus is. It, it, it's, it's about growing and developing, and, and we're not saved by doing certain things. Paul is not saying, hey, here's a list of things you need to do or not do in order to get to heaven. That's not what he's saying. We know that's not what he's saying because in other places in, in Paul's letters, he is very clear that for it is by grace that we are saved through faith, and even the faith is not something we muster up. It is a gift from God so that nobody can boast. It's all a gift. We are given to this. We are given this by God. All we come, we, we come and we receive what he has taken or what he has given to us, what he has bought for us, and we become his children. But, Paul says, I want you to move beyond that stage. Jesus has come to set us free. Now, the first thing he's concerned about is their relationship with each other. He's concerned about their petty divisiveness. And, and that whole list of things that are there are words that describe what happens in a conflict, aren't they? Quarreling, jealousy, anger, selfishness, slander, gossip, arrogance, and disorderly behavior. When that is going on, there is conflict going on. And Paul's concerned that there is conflict in the church. He loves the church from pastoral's perspective. We understand that when there is conflict, any kind of conflict, it, it, it hurts us deeply. It hurts us personally because our lifeblood is in the church. And that's where Paul was. He, he was deeply invested, and he said, I, I, I feel I'm going to come, and I'm going to see you guys fighting each other. And many of us have seen this. Most of us probably have seen this somewhere. You have seen a church that was divided by conflict, and it's ugly isn't it? And you watch that take place, and you, you watch as, as people who said they were friends before now don't talk to each other. You, you hear people in the, the coffee shop, and as you talk to them, they used to talk about how wonderful their church was, but now they're saying, it's terrible, they're saying they're complaining, and so all you're hearing is this negative stuff, and it breaks your heart. Some of you have actually been through those conflicts, You've been right in the middle of them. And I want to tell you something. First of all, I want to say thank you for not giving up on the church. Because there are many people who go through those kinds of conflicts and they say, if this is Christianity, the heck with it. I'm out of here. I want nothing to do with that. So if you've been through one of those conflicts and you're hanging in there, thank you for believing more in the gospel than you do in Christian people. Because I hope that you will find that Jesus will bring us together eventually. So Paul's concern, he says, I don't want to find that. That's not what the church is supposed to be. That kind of divisiveness creates a cancer-like environment in the church, and it hurts the kingdom of God, it hurts the people of the church, and I want you guys to get beyond that. I want you to grow to the point where you care about each other, where you love each other, where you feel with each other, where you're cheering for each other, where you're tolerant of each other. But the second thing relates to personal holiness. He says, I will be grieved because many of you have not given up your old sins. You have not repented of your impurity, sexual immorality, and eagerness for lustful pleasure. Now, understand that Corinth was a very secular city. 
It was a very cosmopolitan city. There were people from all places that would go through uh, Corinth because it was a major trade route. So there was a lot of bad stuff going on in Corinth. And, and a lot of the people in the church came out of that environment. And Paul says, my concern is that, that you've, you've come to faith and, and haven't gone anywhere with it. That you're still living exactly the same way that you used to live. You haven't changed at all. Again, the requirement to be saved is not that you must change so that God will like you. That's not what it is at all. He says, you come to me as you are, and I will love you, and I will save you. I will make you new. Think about it this way. Um, there, there are certain people who have a disease called agoraphobia, and they're, they're people who, who don't want to leave their homes or they don't want to go out into strange places because it makes them afraid. And, and they, they want to stay in their homes because they, they feel safe there. It's comfortable. They, they don't have to worry about anything. They, you know, if they go outside, there could be bad things. People may not like them. They could fall. Something horrible could happen to them. They could get lost, and, and on and on and on it goes. And there are Christians who are like that. There are Christians who feel that, you know, I, I've, I've, you know Christ has made me new, but mm, I don't want to leave the house. Christianity is, is coming into a situation like that, and not only are we saved, not only are we made part of the family of God, but all the, key, all the doors are taken off. All the chains are released. We are now free. We can go out, we can enjoy, and we say to that person who's stuck in their house, you don't understand what you're missing. There is life out there. There's great things to see. There's great adventures to have. There's wonderful people to get to know. You need to go out there. I can't, because this is where I'm comfortable. There are Christians who live that way. Jesus says, you're free. You can leave. You don't have to be a slave of sin any longer. You can live a different life because I have set you free. Come on. Paul says, I'm afraid I'm going to get there, and you guys are still sitting in the house. You're still sitting there as if the chains are on you. They're not anymore. Stop living that way and live the new life that Christ has made for you. But we say, but that's uncomfortable. That's scary. I don't want to go out there. This is what I'm used to. And Paul says, oh, you don't know what you're missing. Come on, he died not only to, to save you from your sin, he died to save you from the slavery of your life. Right across a great story, it's an old story, it's been attributed to a number of different people over the years, I think even to Abraham Lincoln at one time. But it's a story told from the Civil War days uh, before the slaves were freed about a northerner who went to a slave auction and purchased a young slave girl. As they walked away from the auction, the man turned to the girl and told her, you're free. With amazement, she responded, you mean I'm free to do whatever I want? Yes, he said. And to say whatever I want? Yes, anything. And to be whatever I want? Yep. And even go where I want to go? Yes, he answered with a smile. You're free to go wherever you'd like. And she looked at him intently and replied, then I will go with you then I will go with you. I will go with the one who has set me free. The sinner who has been set free from the power and penalty of sin through the payment of Christ on our behalf is a person who has come to recognize that the freest place in life is to be found in being a true follower of Jesus. True freedom is being able to live like the child of the king we are. When we understand that freedom has been purchased for us through the work, death, and resurrection of Christ, we too should desire to go with him wherever he wants us to go. And, and if we get this, if we understand this, if we are people who are willing to risk being hurt and willing to endure hurt in order to love, the only way to escape that hurt is to not love, okay? So we, we risk the hurt and love when we learn to look at people not in terms of what they can do for us, but in terms of being people who are unique and precious for who they are, which is what, incidentally, all of us long for. 
We all long to have somebody who will see us for who we are and not relate to us on the, on the basis of what they can get from us, but just love us for who we are. And if we will be people who cheer for each other and spur each other on to growth and encourage each other to leave the divisive stuff behind and push on to the freedom that Christ has called us to, if we will do that, if we will practice that, before long, people are going to look at you, they're going to look at me, and hopefully they're going to look at, ch at our church and say, that's a place that possesses a godly heart. Let's pray together. Father, we want to be these kinds of people, but the truth is most of the time we don't want to do anything to get there. Fortunately, we know that you are willing to equip us because we couldn't do it on our own. Fortunately, we know that, that you are able to do exceeding abundantly beyond all that we ask or imagine. So help us. Help us to love. Help us to love truly instead of manipulatively. Help us to cheer for each other. Help us to be unified. Help us to grow together. And help us, Father, to, to get the courage to leave the house, to see what you have for us, to enjoy the life that you've created us to live. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.